This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast Show. <laughs> I don't even know what number this is. No, we never do. We never do. Uh, 289. <laughs> You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everyone? This is Brandon Turner. Today is host of the Bigger Pockets podcast here with my co-host, as has been lately, Mr. David Green. David Green, how are you? What's up, BT? I'm doing terrific. I just hired a second uh, real estate assistant for my wow. team here in Northern California, Look and you, this fancy. is the be yeah beginning of her third week. I'm actually growing up and learning how to be a, a grown up and hiring people and trying to be a boss. Wow! Look at you. You're the boss. Good job. Well, thanks, man. It's exciting. Exciting. Uh, you made a comment once. I, I realized I just did it now to you. You once made a joke about how I never call you David. No one ever calls you David. They always call you David Green. I wonder why that is. Why is that? Can anyone know. out there tell me why? What about my face makes you want to say David, David Green, Green instead of just David? <laughs> it must be that there's a lot of Davids. In fact, we just hired another David at Bigger Pockets, so lots of Davids around. But that's okay. You know, David Green, you're a good guy. It's not true what they say about you. Thanks, Brandon. <laughs> All right. Well, today's show uh, is a topical show. Normally, we do a lot of story stuff, but today we have a guest who's been on the show a couple of times before, uh, and we dive really, really, really deep into the topic. Of raising money. This is something that a lot of people wonder. How do you ask for private money lenders? How do you talk to them? How do you approach them? In fact, David, you and the guest even do kind of a, a role playing thing, which is kind of fun. Talking about how do you raise this private money? So that's what we're talking about today. But before we get to that, we got a few housekeeping things to do ahead of time. So, first of all, let's get to today's quick tip. 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 All right, today's quick tip is very, very simple. You should be following Bigger Pockets over on Instagram. Are you not on Instagram? Well, then you're probably not an 18-year-old girl. But if you are on Instagram like I am, uh, you should follow Bigger Pockets at Bigger Pockets. And of course, follow David Green there as well at David Green24. And you can follow me at Beardy Brandon. We're putting a lot of real estate stuff on there. Uh, but really, follow Bigger Pockets. It's a good site. It's a good uh, Instagram page. Good stuff there. That was an easy quick tip, right? Very easy. And a little self-serving, you know? Whatever. I'll take it. Slightly. Let's see which one of us gets more <laughs> follows on our Instagrams from what we had before. Oh, this is such a good idea. All right. Well, right. come follow me. Don't follow David. Or you can follow both of us. All right. And now, I think it's time to get to the show. I don't think we got anything else to really cover except for one thing. If you're not subscribed to the Bigger Pockets podcast, wherever you're listening or watching this, make sure you click that little subscribe button. Helps us out a lot. And then if you haven't left a rating or review, we would really, really appreciate that. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever you're listening to this at. Leave us a rating and review. Let us know uh, what you think and uh, tell the internet that this is a cool podcast. All right. So I do want to say one more thing, a sort of disclaimer before we get into today's show. Please do not take anything we say today as legal advice. This applies to all Bigger Pockets podcast episodes. But today we're talking about something that actually does. There are some legal things involved, and that's when you're raising money. If you're going to go out there and start advertising that you're raising money for your apartment complex deal, know that there are rules and laws that govern this stuff. So this is not legal or tax advice. Just keep that in mind. But the advice is fantastic nonetheless. nonetheless. So uh, definitely check it out. So with that, today we're sitting down with Matt Faircloth. Again, we've had Matt on the show a couple times before. He's even a host of uh, a webinar. He hosts live online classes every couple of weeks over on Bigger Pockets. You probably know him. Uh, he's also also the author of a brand new book that Bigger Pockets is publishing and launching today called Raising Private Capital. You can get it at biggerpockets.com slash private was it private money book? Private capital book. I gotta look that up. Where is it? Biggerpockets.com slash private money book. Biggerpockets.com slash private money book. Uh, but we talk about that later in the show. But honestly, you should just go pick it up. It's fantastic. Only available on Bigger Pockets right now. So uh, biggerpockets.com slash store or biggerpockets.com slash private money book. You can get it there. And uh, with that, you know, Matt, he explains more about a story. So I won't do a long intro, but he's uh, one of the investors I look up to a lot in the real estate space. He's really taken his business to the next level, uh, owns over 300 units. And he talks a lot about how private money helped him to do that. Uh, so without further ado, Let's get over to Matt Faircloth. Matt Faircloth, welcome to the Bigger Pockets podcast. Good to have you, man. 
I'm great, man. It was good, good to be with you guys. Yeah, it should be fun. So uh, we're talking about raising money today. One of those topics that, you know, a <clears throat> lot of people struggle with, especially when you're new. You're not sure how to raise money, who to raise money from. You're insecure. You're saying, hey, I, you know, nobody's going to give me any money. Uh, but that really is a key to to growth, as we'll talk about a little bit later. But uh, you know, before we get into that, I want to go back and kind of visit your story. Uh, a lot of people mm-hmm. listening to this have heard your story before, but for those who have not, uh, why don't you give us a, a quick rundown? Who are you? Where'd you come from? What do you do? Uh, Where'd you come yeah. from? Where'd you come from? <laughs> Where did you grow up? I, well, I grew up in Baltimore, but uh, I, I got it. I got it. Been, I started investing in real estate in 2005 when I quit my day job. Um, uh, you know, just like many, many other folks on the show, read Rich Dad Poor Dad, and it's like, oh my goodness, this is a whole other way to live life and to you know set goals and to something to strive for. So uh, that inspired me to get into real estate, and so um, you know, started out on small stuff and and built a small portfolio uh, using mostly my money, but also um, like pretty much my parents, uh, did some investing in our business as well. Um, and, uh, then grew it into getting into multifamily and bigger fix and flips and, uh, really scaled up a business when we started raising, uh, money from outside investors in 2011. And, uh, now we're in apartment buildings. We own an office complex. We, um, you know, we're diverse. We've got, you know, you know, fixing, we're building properties, we're fixing and flipping properties, and we're also buying apartment buildings and uh, doing some small onesie twosie stuff too. So we're uh, on a lot of parts of the spectrum for real estate investing, and a lot of it has to do with working with private money. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so how many units total do you think you have right now? I, I believe it's somewhere in the 380 range. That's awesome. That's awesome. It is awesome. All right. So, uh, to so pitch let, myself sometimes. Yeah, I know. That's, that's cool. And it's been fun <laughs> because I've known you now for a number of years. So it's fun to kind of see you like, yeah. um, you know, far surpass my abilities and my <laughs> skill. Uh, you're you. just crushing it. So, you know, keep, uh, <laughs> keep going. So, okay, let's talk about raising money. So first question I got for you is, uh, why, like, why is raising money so important? Like knowing how to do this, like why is, why are we dedicating an entire show today just to raising money? Well, you know, there's only so much money that, that I have. I mean, like I have money of my own and I put my own money into my deals, but there's only but so much money that I have. And I can't like we bought a 49 unit apartment building. Um, there's no I, I could not at my capacity at that time. Could I have bought that building on my own with my own capital? So raising money allows me and, and investors to it allows them to access the deals they wouldn't have access to. Yeah, if they didn't have, you know, other people's money working alongside them. So just lets me control and take on bigger deals. In other words, All you right. can, yeah, you can grow more. Yeah. So you, you can grow more and that makes sense because you're using capital to, to kind of fuel the skills that you already have. Tell me mm-hmm. how this is beneficial for the person who's actually letting you borrow their money. Well, it gives them exposure to, um, you know, to, to other, other forms of investment it allow it allows them to, it gives them a, a wealth building tool that they wouldn't have access to through a financial planner or through wall street. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of wall street, uh, of, as, as a place to invest. I mean, I, you know, uh, and, and I think that, um, cause it's just not a whole lot of control, but a, a, a passive investor, uh, has more control, has more collateral, you know, like if Microsoft goes down to zero tomorrow, I, I can't go take the CEO's house, you know, <laughs> You right. Try. But you try. Yeah, right. I could try, you yeah. know, but I don't think I'd get past yeah. the gate. I don't think I'd get past the security <laughs> gates and the Dobermans, you know. Um, but it, but if I loan someone money and I have, uh, if I loan someone money, then I could uh, I could go and take the collateral. I have something that's tangible. That's a just in case security safety net that's there on a loan um, in that. So that's, it, it's, it's such a better investment from a passive investment uh, standpoint for investors, uh, cause they have collateral, they have better rates of return. They can compound the interest and it can grow exponentially. So many different reasons why it's better for them too. Well, so a lot of people ask me when I, when I, when I talk about how I raise money from people or I tell them examples or stories of how I've done it, they say, well, well, why wouldn't that person just go do their own deals then? Why are they going to be happy with, you know, X percent as a loan? You know, mm-hmm. why don't they just go and uh, yeah, do it themselves. Right. I mean, they just go and they do it on my own. And some and some investors could and should. But most of the time, the folks that I've worked with, it's because of time and experience. They don't have either one of those two things. Most of the people that invest with me um, that, that I've worked with for, for, for private investments, 
uh, they're working their tail off or they just love what they do and they don't want to put the time in to go and run the fix and flip or to go and find the rental property or do whatever it is, you know, but we as real estate investors have time. One thing that we're, li- we don't, we need more money, but we have time to put that money to work. Um, we also have experience that we can put forth, uh, you know, experience, relationships, contacts, deals, whatever it is, uh, which that, you know, the doctor or the dentist or the person that's got, or the school teacher, whatever it is that has a profession, um, that, uh, they might not have any of those things, especially the time is the biggest one. And and it takes time to, to run this business. And that's something people discount too much is that it takes time to, to, to run deals and to find opportunities and to make contacts and stuff. So. Yeah, I love yeah. that. I love it. All right. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, I've told this story before here on the show, but I'll say it again. Like I did my very first private note uh, alone. I said this back when we launched the Dave Van Horn notebook, right? So I did a private note alone on somebody, uh, a friend of mine. And yeah, I mean, I think I charged him because it was a friend. I charged him like 8% uh, mm-hmm. on a flip that he was doing. And so it wasn't even that much. Like, I, I feel like I gave him a really good deal. In fact, I usually pay a lot more than that to my private lenders. But, you know, it was my first time. Yeah. That 8% was the best money I've ever made. Like I yeah. loved getting that check because I did nothing for it at all except for yeah. walk out to my mailbox and pick up a check. I mean like I even like I I, just, I yeah. love that money and as a private lender I realize like that's like the top of the the game is being a private lender. And so like yeah, mm-hmm. that's why when people are like, "Well, why would that person want to lend?" Because it's the best money they can make. Like it's really good money. Because so, it's yeah. easy. Yeah. Yep. It's yeah. easy. And there was collateral. Did you have a mortgage? Uh, yes, I did. Yep. Yeah. So you had a collateral. collateral I mean, yep. not that, right. You had collateral. You sleep easy at night knowing yep. your money's protected. Exactly. You know, and you're getting this monthly check that's probably backed up through rents that he's getting yep. or through, you know, you know, other other business ventures that he has going on is providing that monthly check to you. Um, and it's your, it's your money at work. And so it, it is a great opportunity for passive investors. And I think that some active investors like us, I call them cat, I call them deal providers because that's what we do. We provide deals to people that have money that uh, that want to put their cash into a deal. I call them cash providers. But deal providers tend to uh, discount the fact that the, the that the cash provider needs us. They do, and it, and it's really cool investing in deals with us. And I, they, you know, I, I've met uh, deal providers that are a little you know, sheepish about asking for money or they just don't want to go out there and, and, you know, they look at it like they're panhandling or something like that, but they're not. Yeah. These people want the opportunities. And if you present them in the right way, uh, you can build somebody's wealth through investing in your business, you know? So there, this is something I've, I've talked about before as well here on the, on the show, but it, it was like this fundamental shift in my mindset back, I don't know, it probably happened like six years ago when all of a sudden I realized I was not begging I was not begging for money. I was offering an opportunity. And when that, yeah. like, when I first thought of that, like everything changed. I stopped getting worried and, and being all sheepish about asking people for money and, and raising money. It was like, no, I, ha- I like, I'm the hot girl at the bar. Like I've got the deal, <laughs> you know, like, like the, I always felt like I was the dude trying to pick up girls at the bar, but I wasn't like, I was the asset, right? Like, right. and once I realized that, <laughs> Like everything became easier in that regard because I just changed uh, my attitude. You should probably in your book have a chapter called like the hot girl at the bar. <laughs> right. I should. Yeah. Like, I should add that in the hot girl at the bar. That's hysterical. I That's love funny. that. But anyway, it, it's funny, but it's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. I, so, I like cool. to say there's something to about this, right? Like actually investing with somebody else and giving your money and not having to do the work, it not only gets you a return on your money, but when you're not working on a deal and you're not stressing on it and you're not putting your time and energy and resources into it, it also allows you to go out there and make money in other ways that the deal finder can't do because he's working on that deal. There's this, uh, this term in economics called opportunity cost, and it basically speaks about anytime you choose option A, it's not just the money you're making or losing with option A. You have to consider what mm-hmm. you could have made with option B, right? Yeah. And in this deal that Brandon let his friend borrow money, he made 8% interest on it. But how much money do you think you made during that same period of time doing other things because you didn't have to manage the contractor yep. and manage the rehab and find the deal mm-hmm. and deal with the problems that came up and like – like all there's something to be said for even though there isn't necessarily a monetary cost you can put on it there is absolutely an opportunity cost you can put on it when you take on a deal yourself so there's some people that have learned enough about investing that they feel like they can choose the right operator and they can make the right decision and they do way better letting somebody else 
invest for them and make money on the return. And then they put their time into other things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great point. So can you tell me for people who are hearing this and then they're asking like, well, maybe this is something I should do, but I feel scared, right? Is yeah. using other people's money risky? So it can, of course. So the short answer is yes, it, it can, it, it can be, um, it, unless you find the right deals. And I think that it's up to the deal provider to do that. I mean, their side of the bargain is to find, you know, safe investments and deals that have been vetted and to, um, know what they're getting themselves into and not just go and take this, uh, this cash provider's money and go put it on the roulette wheel of real estate, right? That's not what you, that's not what you want to do. You want to, you know, establish the right contacts and put the right property manager in place if that's what you're going to do or do, you know, property manage yourself, whatever it is. Um, but mitigate that risk, um, to make sure that the, the cash provider is well taken care of because you, you know, you are, you as the deal provider are a steward of that cash provider's money. And I think that when you forget that is when it gets real risky and you know, you treat it even as if it's above your own money, that it's, yeah. it's super important. And it's, and these, these are, uh, you are a custodian. So yeah, that's super good. Yeah. And, and that's why yeah. like, that's why we, we stress so much, you know, on being able to find good deals, the better deal you have, the mm -hmm. less risky a thing is. You know, the more and as you guys are just gonna make good deals. Yep. As you guys said, you gotta make you find good deals, but, yeah. but really it's about making, making good them, deals. Yep. As you guys, yeah, as you guys say all the time on the show, which I think is brilliant, because uh, in this in this marketplace, I think in general, you, you gotta you gotta squeeze the lemon and and make something great out of it. Uh, and if you know how to do that, if you learn that, hopefully with your own money first or with some immediate immediate circles money, then once you yep. know how to do it, then you're qual then I think that you're qualified to go out and raise money. I don't think that your very first deal should be with an extended circle of private money. I don't. I think that you've got to earn your stripes first and and get you get some experience under your wings. And and I know that there's some, you know, folks out there, gurus or whatever. I've even seen Facebook ads for for somebody who's out there talking about like, you know, buy an apartment building with no experience and no money down yeah. and everything like that. And I'm like, uh, you know, that's really about like buy my seminar, you know, whatever it is he's got. Yep. But uh, but I but I think that it's really about like you've got to um, learn how to operate this business and get, get, you know, proficient at this business first, and then you can go out and use other people's money. Yeah. You know, and, and you know one thing I, that, that I did kind of accidentally, but I mean, not, maybe not. I mean, like this is, I couldn't get private money. And in fact, we'll talk about that. Maybe we should actually go there first. Well, I'll finish the thought and then we'll sure. go back. So like, I was going to say, I couldn't get private money. I didn't know anybody who was an investor who would ever give me money. So my very first deal, I ended up doing a hard money lender, which was he charged 12% uh, mm -hmm. interest and 12 points, 12 oh, wow. points, which means for those people who don't know, it means 12% of the loan he charged me as a fee. So like Ooh. it was, I think it was a, the very first one was like an $80,000 uh, loan. So I think I paid him. What's that? Like I don't know, nine grand or whatever that is. Did he put like a local anesthetic on before he did that? Or was that <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, it was insane. Right. And in fact, like that deal, I never really made a lot of money on that flip, but the point was like, I, wonder why. I yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Like he made, the, the, he made so much more than I did. Uh, but I got into a deal. Like that's what I had to do. I had no experience. I had no knowledge of what I was doing and he knew that. So he, like he was, it was an incredibly risky loan for him. And mm -hmm. I had to pay that. Now, you know, I had to go out and find a good enough deal that would make him happy to do it. But that might be, mm -hmm. if you're just getting started, like you might have to pay a lot of, now hopefully you don't pay 12 and 12, but like you might have to pay a lot of money. But if that's what it takes to say that you've done yep. a deal, then that's fine. That's because it. the last thing I want anybody to do is to sit down in front of a potential private money partner that has potential like hundreds of thousands of dollars to put to work in your business. Like, like game changing, you know, money or equity or whatever. And you sit down and you're like, well, I've never done anything of this before. I've never even, you know, never even been involved in a real estate transaction one way or another. Uh, they're most, unless they like and respect you because you're you, like if this is like your uncle Charlie, I, maybe they'll, they'll still do it. <laughs> um, but if this is somebody who has real capital to put, to put work in your business and also maybe a network of other people that are willing to do the same thing, odds are they're not going to do it. And so what you paid 12 plus 12, you've done a flip, you've accomplishment, you've, you've checked the box. Right. Yep. And, and I was in the same boat. I've done, I've bought a lot of hard money when I first got started. Started and I did. I like took out credit card loans and yep. um, did all. Did whatever it took to get going. And then now that I've done that and I've established a track record for myself, yep. um, then I'm able to you know reach out for more attractive capital. Yeah, that's that's so good. Okay, so let's let's take a step back now and maybe cover something I should have covered early on. 
what are we talking about when we say raising money? I mean, for those people who are have like are still like, well, what what are they talking about? I mean, are we thinking like <laughs> this is Uncle John who's going to give us some money? Or are we talking like going to put you know putting on a suit and going to a skyscraper to pitch people? Or what what do you mean when you say private money? Right. So when I when I say raising private capital or raising private money, I mean um, you know going to folks that are in your you know, in, in your circles, it doesn't have to be a media circle. It doesn't have to be like, you know, your parents or your siblings or whatever. It, it just people that, you know, in your greater circles, um, and explaining to them what you do as a real estate investor, showing them and understanding how real estate investors can benefit those that don't want to do it full time. Like we all do, right. Explaining all of that and then enrolling them in the possibility of working with us as a private money as a private money partner in what in whatever fashion that looks like that when I say raising, raising private capital, I'm talking about doing out of your own network. Um, you know, could be your Facebook community could be whatever it looks like and uh, in that but it does not necessarily mean like you said putting on a suit and walking into a skyscraper skyscraper and convincing a hedge fund to you know put 10 million dollars to work in your business um that's probably not the first step the first step is probably going to the guy you went to high school with you know that you're still friends with on facebook that you have no has a good job that he loves but you know it just doesn't have time and he wants to put it to work in the business so that's a good segue. So let's say I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, you know, I've done a deal or two. I listen to bigger pockets every day. I, I know what I'm doing here. I have a good idea how to invest. I just need a little more capital to ramp this up. Yeah. I don't want to go to a bunch of strangers that I don't know and put on a conference and try to convince them. Like I'm not at that level. I kind of want to dip my toe into the waters and get used to this. Yeah. Is it a good idea to start with family friends first? Can you, can you answer that? So I think so. Um, you've got to get beyond the, it, it's, it's with your comfort level too. Um, that's how I got started. But, um, but that doesn't mean that's how you have to get started. If you, if you're not comfortable talking to friends and family, you got to look at other networks around you that you can go to. Um, you know, I, 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 uh, I joined a BNI group, which is a networking group, you know, and everything like that. I was able to, you know, form some strategic alliances, uh, with money partners through a BNI group. And so there's other networking organizations you can go to that are outside of your local RIA group. Um, uh, and that, but I, I do, I do recommend talking to friends and family. Uh, I think that there's you, if someone, if a deal provider or an investor has that fear, they really need to examine uh, why they have that fear. Is it because that they're not confident in themselves or is it because they are worried that they're going to lose their friends and family's money? Um, you know, why, why do they feel that way mm. first? Let's examine that and their confidence in their business and themselves before they go and completely discount. I won't talk to people that are my friends and family, you know, yeah, maybe you, maybe, you know, in your heart, you're not ready yet. And that's why you don't want someone, you yeah. know, to go into business with you. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's why you're not comfortable, you know, putting people that you like and care about at work in your right. business. But if you're not comfortable doing that, I, I would ask questions before I completely discount it. So why don't we try this? Why don't you approach me? I'll be your buddy from high school who you know has done well and I have some money. And you approach me with this uh, proposition that you want to use my money to earn more money. And we'll role play that for people to hear so they can kind of get an idea of how easy these conversations can be. Okay, cool. So are you still David Green? Yeah, I'll be David Green. Okay, cool. You'll be David? Okay, cool. Hey, David, what's up, man? How you doing? What's going on, bro? How yeah. are you? So what do you what do you do these days? What are you up to? Last time I checked, you were in another job. What, what are you doing these days? Well, I was investing in real estate, but I became a realtor and I started a team and I'm just, man, it's kicking my butt. I'm working 16 hour days selling a bunch of houses. I just don't have any time left to do anything with my yeah. money. Oh, that's crazy. So, well, I, you know, I'm really active in investing and I'm on the other side of it. I, I've got more deals than I have money. I mean, I've, we just bought an apartment building. Um, I've got, you know, a bunch of fix and flips going and stuff like that. And it's really insane. That it's, it's, I'm really excited. It's the, pro the problem I'm having is, you know, I have all these deals and not a lot of money to put to put forth into it. Sounds like you got a Lamborghini, but no gas. Yeah, I know. I need gas. So um, to put a pin in it here. What, what I find that you threw me off by saying that you're an active and you're that you weren't investing before, because what I find here's what I do when I say that I'm I'm active in investing. You know what I do uh, when I'm when I bring that up and I tell people, even if you're not a full time investor, you should mention that you're a real estate investor. When you talk to people at the cocktail party or at the you know, at wherever you are, just say I'm a real estate investor, even put it on Facebook, whatever it is. Because you'll find that a lot of people say, man, I, geez, I sure wish I could invest in real estate, too, but I just don't have the time. 
And that's the key phrase that the potential private money partner or the cash provider says. And when they do, you can easily turn that around and say, you know what, David Green, I understand you don't have the time, but guess what? I do. And I have the network, the time, the resources, the know-how to help money to work in real estate. We could show you a way to make that happen. And that's when the light goes off in your head and, and everything like that. It's like, you know what? He's right. I have money to put to work in real estate. And, you know, and he could, sh- and what you go further with is like, well, maybe I don't have a whole lot of cash, but there's uh, what I, what I talk about further in the book is, um, the, the other means that people may not realize they even have to put to work in your real estate business. So these people don't need to have like a half million dollars in cash just sitting in their savings account that could yeah. go to work in your business. They could have a retirement account. And, you know, there, there's a lot of different ways you can put retirement money to work in real estate. Um, they could own their home free and clear or almost free and clear. Uh, and they can put that money to work in real estate. So they don't have to be independently wealthy um, with, uh, with just millions sitting around waiting for somebody to come and pitch them on a real estate deal. Uh, as real estate investors, we need to get educated in different ways that money can play in our business and then become educators to potential private money partners of this is how your money can work for me and this is how it's going to benefit you and how I can make you wealthy through means you didn't even know about. So I feel like the biggest concern that most people are going to have is how do I know I'm going to get my money back? You know, like the return is important, but I don't think that people even listen to you about that until they feel safe with this proposition you have. How do you handle that objection from people when that's what they're concerned about? That's great. And, and I think that you're bringing up the number one question that a potential cash provider has uh, when they're looking for the first time to invest with somebody. And so many deal providers I talk to want to get into the deal. They want to talk about how sexy this apartment building deal is or how much money this fix and flip is going to make and everything like that. But what the thing is, is that the cash provider doesn't, they really, that's not their first, second or third question. It's, it's not, they, they care more about, can I, like first question is like, can I trust you? Yeah. And unless it is your uncle Charlie, uh, or your cousin Joanna or whatever, right? That's the first question is, can I trust you? Are you going to do the right thing with my money? Um, and then the next question is, as you just said, David, am I going to get my money back? And then it's your role as the deal provider to sit them down and say, okay, here's the nuts and bolts of the deal. Here's how you get it back. Here's how you're protected, you know, with this mortgage on a private loan. Or if you're doing a private equity deal, this is how you have ownership in the property. Here's the operating agreement and here's your name. You know, this is where you go right here and you have ownership alongside that. So it's about explaining how they're protected. And then the deal is going to unwind like this. And this is when you're going to get your money back. And this is when we sell, you're going to get a check or uh, you're going to get monthly dividends, whatever it looks like. Explaining that in, in finite detail on how the, where the money goes in and when it comes out, how they get it back. And then like once you've established their level of trust and their level of comfort, um, then beyond all that, then you can start talking about what kind of returns they're going to get. That should never be the lead because then you kind of look like a snake oil salesman talking about like, I, I can get you 18% on your money yep. Um, yep. in that. Once they like and trust you, then you can talk about that kind of stuff. But but you've got to establish that kind of stuff first. I, I love that you said that because again, I think a lot of people want to lead with, oh, you're going to get a 10% return. You're going to be 12% return. But like you said, like that's not what they really care about. The they question they want to answer is, can they trust you? So yeah. Like, yeah. I love, I love to start with when I'm talking to people, I love, I love to start with stories or talk about things that I've done. Cause then they get a, like a real good yes. understanding. Like, yeah, I, I had a buddy, like we bought a, we, you know, I needed money for a triplex. So he let me on the triplex. He was earning, you know, a good return on his money. Uh, and he it made sure that he was safe. So if I didn't, if I'm, you know, packed up and moved over to Mexico for a, you know, go live on the beach and be a bum, he could take the property back and actually would make more money than what he was making from me lending. And like by telling a story mm-hmm. like that, it illustrates that, they put themselves in the, that person's shoes without you trying to sell them anything. I mean, stories are just fantastic for reasons like that in general. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. yeah no, love, it really that. is. I mean, there's there's a lot of great stories of um, that I can think of of folks, and I've done I've done business with probably over a hundred private money partners in in my career up till now, and looking at what they've been able to do with the money. I got people that that got their kids going in college with the money they made and with through doing private money deals with us with my company. Um, I've got, I've got a, a guy who's halfway, he's halfway there. He's looking to do enough deals with my company to where he can have a passive income to where he can move back to his home country in Argentina and make enough to live in Argentina off of passive income. And this guy's like 32 years old right now. Wow. And he's wow. going to, he'll probably in the next three years, I'll bet you he'll move back 
back to Argentina um, because through doing passive investments through my company. It's, it's amazing. I'm so grateful I'm able to provide that to him. There's something about real estate I was thinking about as you were talking, Matt, where I was comparing it to other investment opportunities. I don't know of anything else that you can buy and have collateral of the property you can take back if something goes wrong. Yeah. If you buy Bitcoin and the price of Bitcoin drops, there's nothing you get in return for that. You know, If you buy stocks and the company goes, like the stock drops, you get nothing in return. Uh, I can't think even of probably any Even if you other. buy a bond, and a bond is a loan, but the company could easily just file bankruptcy. Oh, that loan goes away. Bye bye. You know, I mean, there's very little things have true collateral aside from sticks and bricks in real estate. Mm. That's awesome. It really is. Yeah. Well, cool. So I, I want to shift gears a little bit here and talk about the couple different types of raising money. When people talk about debt money or equity, you know, what what is the difference? Mm -hmm. Which do you prefer? How should listeners kind of approach that? Can you talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, well, I recommend that people start with debt because it's simpler, it's easier to understand, it's not complicated, there's way less regulations around it and everything like that. And what is the difference um, there? Sure. Uh, debt is like, you know, bar the simplest way to, you know, to explain debt is just, just borrowing money. It's me going to David and say, hey, David, can I borrow, uh, you know, $10 to go buy my lunch over here or something like that? Uh, <laughs> or it's borrowing $100,000 from David from his, his self-directed IRA account. Um, and giving him collateral on a property that I'm going to be fixing up and everything like that. And he and I, because it's a private money deal, it's a, it's a, I can go back and forth and negotiate the terms of that deal with him. Unlike, that's what's great of, of private money versus hard money uh, or bank money or whatever, that David and I can sit down and say, you know what, David, listen, this is a fix and flip. It's not producing cash flow right now. I'd like to pay you at the end of the project when the property sells, are you okay if I just let the interest accrue until the property you know, sells at the end? Then David might say something like, you know, Matt, that's great. I'm comfortable with that. Are you okay if I charge one more percent interest in exchange for letting the money you know, pile up until the end of the deal? And it's, yeah, that's great. Let's do that. And he, we can have that conversation. It's hard to do that with a bank or with a hard money lender or whatever. And so um, debt, that's what debt is. So it's, it's just you know me borrowing money from David uh, giving him some sort of collateral on the property and then me going forth and doing a burr or doing a flip or doing whatever it is with the money, um, uh, you know, until the project's complete. So is it fair to say that debt is basically paying someone for the use of their money with your money and equity is giving them a piece of the deal and paying them for their money with a percentage of the profit that comes out when you're done? Yeah. Yeah. They own a percentage of the property alongside you. That's perfectly. That, that's a great way to explain it. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. Cool. All right, so another big question people want to know. They know now what uh, you know what raising money is and kind of how to approach people, but how do you find them? Like a lot of people just say, "I don't know rich people. I don't hang out with rich people." Uh, I, That's like the you biggest said earlier, misconception yeah. is that you need you need rich people yep. to put to work in your business, and and I think that that's that's probably something that I'd love to. Uh, that, that I'd love to just tell most real estate investors is these people do not need to be multi multi millionaires, and if they're gonna, if you're going to do debt. They don't even need to be accredited. And I know that that's this big misconception. We can talk about accredited investors real quick, but people think that that you have to only be working with accredited investors to do debt deals. And you don't even need to be working with accredited investors to do um, equity deals either, but we can talk about that in a second. Uh, do you want me to cover what accredited is? Sure. I know that's sure, something that... Okay. It's just, it, it's a certain um, uh, like stamp that an investor gets to say that they are. And that's if they earn over a certain dollar amount per year. It's like 200, I think it's like 200,000 if they're uh, single, 300,000 if they're married. They have to have a net worth over a million, not including a primary residence. And there's some other stipulations in there too. Um, but th that is, it's one of those stamps that investors think that the real estate investors like deal providers think that their cash providers need to have to do business with them, but they don't. Um, you could be dealing business with your with with a sibling or something like that. Just happens to have two hundred thousand sitting in an IRA account. That they're qualified to loan money to you, and and the, the sibling doesn't have to have over a net worth over a million in net worth, whatever it is. Um, they just they just have to have the money, and they're willing that they're willing to put to work in your business. Yep. You so know, on that topic, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Brandon. Well, I was going to say like, yeah, I, I partnered or worked with a, a lender who just had money in a, a home equity line of credit. Like they, you know, they didn't have a lot yeah. of cash sitting around, but in talking with them, they're like, oh yeah, well, well our house is paid off. The house is worth 200,000. So you have $200,000 just sitting there like, and they're like, oh yeah, we have a line of credit on it too. We just haven't used it. So they had like a hundred, yeah. I think it was like a $150,000 line of credit just 
sitting there. So yeah, yeah, it's it's well. There's so many misconceptions on what what it takes to invest in real estate, and I think that that's that that's one thing that you, you know I, I I do my best to cover. Um, and I had to, I had to get, like deeply educated on myself because a lot of people were asking me stuff like that, and I wanted to make sure that I was checking all the right boxes and yep. maintaining a legal status for myself. Um, so I learned a lot about those kinds of things. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I, I put it out there uh, when we, uh, you know, when I wrote the book about, uh, about what you need to, uh, you know, what it takes to cover yourself from a legal standpoint, especially when you do equity deals. Cause that's like this whole big gray area that a lot of people think that they're stepping into, uh, and into the great unknown when they start assembling people to invest on the ownership side with them. But, um, it's way simpler than people are making it. And, um, and there's a lot of misconceptions out there around it too. Yeah, that's so true. So what do people need to know about raising money and making sure that they're not breaking any SEC guidelines or rules? Yeah. Um, well, okay. First of all, this is a huge misconception, but when you borrow, if I borrow money from you, um, that's not an, that I'm not, the, the SEC gets involved. Let me back up. The SEC gets involved during the, in the sale of a security. Okay. So if I sell you a security, that is a that's something the SEC. Well, I mean, that's what the S stands for, by the way. <laughs> you know, <right? laughs> Securities so, and Exchange Commission for that's we right. It says for yeah. Securities and Exchange Commission, and so they get involved if in the in the sale of securities. But if I borrow money from you, I did not sell you a security because for me to sell you a security, you have to be on the same side of the transaction as me. And believe it or not, it's viewed to be you borrowing me borrowing money from you is viewed to be an adversarial transaction. Where I, like you could come and take my property, um, and I have to pay you interest and everything like that. And so we're not on the same side of the deal. We could become adversaries because you know you could come and take the asset that I'm working on and everything like that. But uh, so it has to be an investment of equity. So that's the first, and that's why people like all oh, the SEC gets involved in private loans. They actually don't. If it's me borrowing money from you directly, that the SEC doesn't get involved in that. Um, there's four other things that qualify it as a security. Number one is it has to be an investment of money. So if David and I decide he and I are going to partner up and link arms and start up a real estate brokerage and both put in sweat, that's not a security because we didn't both put in money. We put in sweat into the deal. Um, the, the, the second thing is there has to be an expectation of profit, meaning Brandon can't just say it was like more like not like Brandon, but you know, somebody like my uncle Charlie can't say, Hey Matt, I see you're investing in real estate. I'm just going to give you 10 grand as a, you know, the hope you get going. Or this is also like things like Kickstarter where people just put money up into your business, um, as a, you know, good luck with that, you know, kind of thing. That's not an expectation of profit. They're just giving it to you, you know? Um, so those things discount it from being a security. Um, and the other thing is, is, uh, is I just said, it has to be, you have to be on the same side of the transaction. Um, and, uh, and there's another one and geez, I'm, I'm on the spot here and I'm forgetting it. So, uh, I don't <laughs> that's remember, right. that's I'll right. remember well, in a second, but this is a good point to say I'm not a lawyer. And then so you should consult with a lawyer uh, on these, on these kinds of things when you, uh, when, when you do security transactions, because I'm definitely not, as you can tell. So that makes sense. So, so you, you talk a lot more about this legal stuff within the book, but you also, I believe did like a, a bonus video. Isn't that right? Yes. With an attorney. Tell us about that. Yeah. And that's where I've met. That's where he covers all four of these prongs. Maybe we'll leave it as a secret or whatever, but there's four <laughs> prongs you have to cover for something to be a security. I've covered three of them right here. Um, but, uh, as a bonus, um, item for the book, I sit down with my, uh, my attorney, Gene Trowbridge, uh, who is an absolute brainiac when it comes to the legal side of securities and what is legal and what's not legal when a transactions. Um, and I do, an, I think it's like an hour and a half interview with him. And we just do an absolute like deep dive to the bottom of the marinara trench together uh, and, and talk about all the SEC regs and what is legal, what's not legal. And um, that's one of the bon one of the four bonus items that are available with the book. That's awesome. Well, that's probably a good transition. Let's talk about the book real quick because uh, it's launching today here uh, with the, uh, yeah, with this podcast. It's launching. So congratulations. How's it feel to be a published author? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I have to pinch myself. I literally have go. to pinch myself, but yeah. That's thank awesome. You. Well, welcome to the club. It's it's a lot of fun. So, all right. The book is called what? It's called Raising Private Capital. And what's it about? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Bigger Pockets is not like to get creative with the book no, titles. No, we, we like, keep our like, titles this is, pretty, this is what it's yeah. about. Right? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty simple. All right. So it's yeah. called Raising Private Capital, subtitled yes. Building Your Real Estate Empire Using Other People's Money. Yes. Which is awesome. Of yeah. course, people can go get, pick it up at biggerpockets.com slash private money book. And if there was like one thing you wanted people to know, like, hey, you should get this book because what? Because it's a, it, the book 
talks about how to create win-win scenarios. And it's about how we as deal providers can win big and get ourselves into way larger transactions and 10 times your portfolio and everything like that through working with private capital and how we working with other with folks that are investing with us as cash providers that don't have the time or the wherewithal of the network to invest in real estate but have the capital one way or another how they can just absolutely exponentially build their wealth through working with us so it's about how private capital arrangements are absolutely win-win or win-win scenarios that that we can assemble and and benefit both sides. That's so true. That's awesome. Uh, just reading off kind of the back of the book here, or a little bit of information. It says uh, inside you'll discover private money partners in places you didn't know existed. The prerequisites requ- prerequisites. Am I saying that right? Prerequisites <laughs> for needed to start raising money. How to structure debt and equity deals when using uh, when and when to use each strategy. The best way to provide win-win deals. How to protect all parties involved using in, in a private money transaction. Proper private equity exit strategies and so much more. So I know I, I I've, this book looks amazing. Amazing. Uh, I'm waiting for Katie to send me my actual copy. We're filming, or we're recording this here, uh, you know, a month and some ahead of time. But uh, you know, I, I'm excited for this book. So uh, yeah, super cool. So people, Thank can, you. yeah, they can get it at BiggerPockets.com/slash/private-money-book. Again, BiggerPockets.com/slash/private-money-book, uh, and that is all you can get it right now. That's the only <laughs> place we're selling right now is on Bigger Pockets. Uh, we will eventually, hopefully, get it over on Audible and Amazon and all that. But right now, we're only launching it uh, and selling it on Bigger Pockets. Uh, it's kind of a special treat to our, our members here at BP. And when you actually get it, as we like to do, we like to overwhelm people with value with bonuses. That's how we operate at Bigger Pockets. So. When you get it, you're going to get four bonus content things. First of all, mm-hmm. is that thing we just talked about, the Protect Yourselves from SEC Violations interview with syndication attorney Gene Trowbridge. Uh, next, you had ebook ty- an ebook called 10 Steps to Analyzing uh, an Apartment Building Deal. That sounds amazing. Uh, you and an apartment guy, mm-hmm. and like, there's some special things about analyzing apartments that, that I know you're really good at, Matt. Yeah. Uh, so I'm assuming you go into all that stuff there. The reason why we provided that was because a lot of people that put private money to work uh, in, in somewhere or another eventually want to do it in apartment buildings. Yep. It's it, it's it's kind of hot right now, but also it's a great place to you know put cash providers, and that's a good way for deal providers to win too. So I thought it was a valid conversation. So I pretty much wrote um, an ebook on you know, finding and and putting together and structuring apartment building deals. That's awesome. And then we got a worksheet, fail-proof action plan to secure your first private money deal. What is that? Mm-hmm. That's a roadmap to the. So people read people read this book and they'll say, "Geez, where do I start? What should I do now?" And so the like that that um, uh, action plan is really just like so. Follow this. Here is your roadmap to go through your first deal. So it's taking someone who's done a few transactions and has done some sort of you know dip their toe in real estate a bit. Um, but okay, I'm, I'm ready to start raising private money. What should I do now? Well, that action plan, that roadmap is it. Like that's follow this and this will pretty much talk you through the action steps of the book. And it's like a, like an interactive workbook that they can just fill out and it'll, it'll take them through their first transaction. Perfect. Perfect. And then of course, uh, we want to encourage, we like to encourage people to take action quick. Uh, and because like, again, if, if you don't, jump at stuff, life passes you by, right? So we are offering a exclusive launch only uh, online class with you. It's a live class. So uh, this encourages people. We want you to, we want you to pick up the book and want you to start changing your life right away. So for those people who buy in the first two weeks of this launch uh, before (laughs) August 10th, you're going to get invited to a special live online class with Matt. Matt, what are you going to be talking about in that class? We're going to talk about structuring your first equity deal. And I talked about how uh, these should, people should start with debt. Um, but once people are ready to move into equity or thinking about doing equity in the future, um, I talk about just the step-by-step process that you need to do to structure an equity deal. And I'll talk about the four prongs that I just mentioned that make something a security um, and uh, ways you can either mitigate those to make it so the deal you're doing is not a security that takes the SEC out of the equation. And if you want to do an SEC um, you know, qualified deal, uh, I'll talk to, I'll talk you through how to do that as well. So it's going to be a really chock full of, um, of lots of, you know, lots of goodness and, and, uh, it really help people get going on to the next level to take, to do equity stuff. That's awesome. And of course, like we will record that webinar. So if you buy in the first, you know, during the launch, the first two weeks, but you, before was it August 10th, uh, if you buy in that and you can't make it to the live class, you will still be able to get access to the webinar, uh, recording. But again, that's only if you purchase before 
August 10th. So don't delay. And if you're listening to this podcast way in the future at some point uh, after the launch is over, still go to biggerpockets.com slash private money book, pick up a copy, get all this cool stuff. Uh, and the book really is like going to change lives. I mean, really like, like you said mm-hmm. earlier, it took you, I think you mentioned earlier before we started recording that it took you like six years, right. To get to 30 units. And then it took another six yep. years to get to 300. Like this literally helped you 10 X your business. Yep. Once you learned how to harness other people's money. It's been incredible. It's been, I mean, raising private capital has been a game changer for us. And if I look at the lives of the people that have worked with us as well, it's been a game changer for them too in investing in our business. Yeah. Super cool. And you know, one reason I'm excited to read this is because, you know, like I have not raised a lot of money. I've raised some money, uh, but I'm nervous every time. Like it always is kind of, is a, is a scary sort of thing, but the truth about anything, when you're scared of doing anything, the more you educate yourself, the less fear you have typically of that. Uh, and so I'm, mm-hmm. I'm excited, you know, more than usual for this book because <laughs> I want to learn, like, I want to get over that fear of asking people, uh, and to work with people to raise my money for my deals. So anyway, super mm-hmm. excited. So anyway, you guys check that out. Uh, I'm again, biggerpockets.com slash private money book. Now we're going to move on here and talk about the deal deep dive, which we're going to do here next. And then we're going to do the fire round and the famous force. So let's go first Ooh. to a new segment of the show, which we are just uh, now introducing called the deal deep dive the deal deep dive this new segment of the show where we're going to go deep into one particular deal to really like get people uh, uh make them feel like they're there right we're going to go into detail on this thing so matt what is the deal you want to talk about today with your in, in today's deal deep dive sure I, since we're talking about private capital today i thought it'd be interesting to talk about my very first private money deal that wasn't like with immediate family it was with someone who was a you know third party that came in not related to us uh because it's a really, really interesting story you guys throw up so uh, we uh, this was through an investor that was through an alumni association with my wife um, through a through a uh, her grad school and again same thing like she mentioned they were doing some real estate stuff and he said the key words of geez I sure wish I could invest in real estate but I don't I just don't have the time and was like ding and my wife said you should talk to my husband and so I went up and had breakfast with this guy we talked about deals um, he was willing to he's you know I've got about fifty thousand bucks that I'm willing to put to work in real estate I just don't know where to put it um, and I said. Great. Good to know. Let me get back to you. And so uh, about a month later, um, this was like like post crash and a lot of things were cheap and stuff like that. But they, everything needed a bunch of work and had a, needed a bunch of hair plucked off of it. So a uh, local wholesaler approached me with two townhomes that were for sale for I mean, this is, you know, right here in Trenton, New Jersey, uh, two two bedroom, one bath townhomes for sale for, for like forty five thousand um, combined. Um, now they, they needed work. Uh, on simultaneously, uh, somebody that, uh, that was like a, like a local family friend, um, had approached us and said, Hey, I've got some IRA capital and he had done real estate investing with another guy's IRA. So he actually sat me down and showed me what he had been doing with IRA capital. And I talked to my attorney and researched it and, um, put together a proposition to this, uh, to this other investor and working with with my friend's IRA, like friend of the family's IRA. And cause he couldn't put, he, you can't take the IRA money and put it to work in your own business. Yep. Um, you, you can't, you, you can't take IRA money, put to work with these people ask me that all the time. Can I take my IRA money and give it to myself? No, you can't stop right there. Uh, you have to work with somebody else. Um, and that, so he put his, he offered up his IRA money. He also had 50 grand. And so I took this private uh, equity guy who was, you know, my, my wife's alumni friend, he put up 50 and then I borrowed 50 from this uh, IRA from this, you know, friend of our family. And we put together a hundred grand, no, none of my own money um, and bought these two townhomes and then put, bought them for, you know, 45 grand and then put in another 50 grand worth of renovation uh, money into them. Right. So full investment of, of $100,000. So 50 in equity and then 50 in, in a loan. So $100,000 investment, renovated them, fill, filled them up full of tenants. Uh, once we were done that, they uh, they appraised for 150 grand uh, That's combined. Awesome. So, right, so it's Burr. Yes, was a, so it was a Burr property. It was a Burr deal, which was awesome because you know we they appraised for a good bit more than we had invested in equity and debt. So we were able to refinance them. We paid off the private lender um, in the refinance. I was also able to pull out some of my equity guys' capital, and we took that that like seed capital he had in, and we did more deals with it. And so we were left with these two um, these two townhomes that were leased, cash flowing nicely and everything like that. We, we had that, and then we took the equity and put it forth into other, into other uh, uh, opportunities, which was awesome. We then, we held the properties for about six years and then just sold them uh, about a year ago. 
um, yeah, to on, as a turnkey because I had another investor that came to me that said, hey, I'm looking to buy investment properties. I qualify for bank money. I've got some of my own money to put forth into a deal and I'd like to start buying some rentals. And so we sold those two properties to him, made a nice profit. And, um, and, you know, he was, he was very happy. He, the, the, the turnkey buyer was making, is making a great return on his money as well. And me and this equity guy from years ago now got another check. We, you know, he got a check, we got a check from, from the refinance that we were able to put forward in new deals. We made passive income, uh, monthly, you know, for years and years. And then we got a nice check at the end when we sold the property. So, uh, phenomenal opportunity and the private lender that lent to us at his, at his, his IRA, uh, did business with us for years and years from there on forward too. So that's awesome. Do you remember what, what yeah. did it rent for? Do you remember that? Uh, so let's see, we appraised each property appraised for seven fifty a p or 75,000 a piece. Uh, rents were when we first did the work rents were at nine fifty. So a awesome. little more than the 1% rule, like the 1.3% rule. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so cash flow came, cash flow came in around 350 bucks a month per property. That's cool. Did the tenants pay their own water sewer garbage in there? That's what's great about single family homes. Yep. Um, yeah. You know, I, 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 I have a theory that there's no there's no better investment than a single family home with a tenant that pays their rent on time and doesn't move. Fair, um, fair, you know, fantastic. yeah, but then they move out at some point <laughs> and then you then you get crushed when the tenant moves out and you get to pay to renovate it and everything like that, which is uh, which is where it's just where it hurts. But uh, but once the tenants in there, they pay all the utilities, they shovel the snow, they do everything. Yep. You know, it's great. You know, in fact, so, I'm actually talking uh, today. I'm doing it actually like in an hour from now or two hours <laughs> from now um, from when we're recording this anyway, not when this goes live. But I'm actually doing a webinar for Bigger Pockets on single family houses because I agree there, there are some fantastic benefits to owning single family houses. Uh, so that's what I'm talking about. So if you guys want to see what's going on, I'll, I'll do that webinar. I try to do it every three or four months. So it's probably coming up again sometime soon. Uh, but to see what webinar is going on this week, go to biggerpockets.com slash webinar to see a list. Or if you are a Bigger Pockets pro member, you can watch re replays of all the past webinars. So go to biggerpockets.com slash pro replay and check out the, the replay on the financial freedom through single family houses webinar. Uh, that was uh, back a few months ago. So, or a month ago, whatever it was. All right. So with that, that's cool. Um, so last question of the deal deep dive, what did you learn from that? If you had to pick out like a lesson or two that you learned from that experience of that property, uh, looking back both good or bad. Well, that was my first burr deal. Um, okay. and that's, so I, 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 before I was, before I knew uh, bigger pockets and knew of that, I learned, uh, the power of buying, adding value and then recouping some of that value through a refinance. I learned that, um, I learned how to structure an equity deal, um, because me and this, this equity investor put together, uh, like a, a, you know, a partnership where I did most of the work. He did some work, but I did most of the work. Um, and, uh, and that, which, um, which was, uh, which was, was a great arrangement there. And I also learned how to structure private loans. And so I learned a ton. I mean, it was, it was, uh, a very small project in the, in the grand scheme of things, but I learned a ton, of to play, uh, you know, a million times over to, to grow our portfolio from there. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. All right. Well, cool. Well, uh, that was the end of the first deal deep dive. Uh, everybody, I would mm. encourage you, if you enjoyed that segment, you like that segment, let us know, hit us up on social at bigger pockets and let us know if you like the deal deep dive, we're going to be, uh, you know, tweaking that testing it kind of come up with, but I, I really love that idea of just going deep into a topic. So, uh, let us know your feedback again, any of the social media networks at bigger pockets, and you can, uh, let us know there. Uh, with that, let's head over to the world famous fire round fire round. It's time for the fire round. All right, let's get to the fire round. These questions come direct out of the Bigger Pockets forums, the world's greatest, largest, most important forum for real estate investors on the internet. Uh, these are real questions that people are asking, and we thought you'd be a good one to answer them, helping out the community, as I know you already do, Matt. Look, number one, hmm, what kind of rates are investors getting? from private lenders and what kind of holding periods and are they getting interest only or are they paying, uh, you know, amortized for private lenders? Okay. Uh, so I rarely amortize a private loan to an investor because I recommend doing private loans for short term projects, because if it's a long term project, you can get better loans from a bank, whether if you're not bankable, there's people you can work with that can be your sponsor, can help you get a loan. So I rarely do any a loan longer than say like six to 12 months to answer the time thing. And that's why I don't amortize because why would I amortize a loan over like six to 12 months? You're just not going to get the benefits of it. Right. Um, <clears throat> with regards to rates, 
uh, I typically pay somewhere between like seven to nine, maybe 10%. I try and avoid points at all cost. Um, and that, and just, if you're just getting started in, in raising and uh, borrowing private money, that's what I pay. You may have to pay more than that. You may have to pay similar to what you paid for your first, uh, for your first deal, like the, yeah. you know, like 12 plus 12 or whatever, uh, just so you can get your foot in the door and do a deal and, and that. But I think that as you've got more seasoning and you've done more and more projects, you can start commanding what the rates are, um, as you move forward. Very nice. All right. Next question. I am interested in working with private money lenders, but I see that many of the sites out there are scams. Is there a serious, reliable source for private money lenders available? Yeah, see, that's I, I don't recommend those online sites yeah. for finding private money lenders. I recommend you, you know, uh, in the book, I talk about how to find them right around you, even though you might not think you know private money folks. Uh, I, I talk about how to look for them in places that you didn't think to look and um, what the signs that like the the, the, the the signs, the hints of private money leaves and everything like that and how to look for it. So I don't recommend looking for it online for those very reasons, because I think a lot of those sites are either scams or it's, it's a hard money lender in disguise. Yep, that's so. exactly that's a really good point. Yeah. People want yeah. things handed to them on a silver platter and not have to work for it. They're like, well, should there, yeah. there should be a website of people who just want to give me money for free and then they can. Yeah, right. I want to go to give me money for free dot com. Yeah, that's exactly. a website, right? You just go to give me money dot com and just go and I can borrow money at four and a half percent with no collateral, no terms, you know, exactly yeah. what then I would invest in real estate. But, you know, yeah, it's, right. it's people are looking at it. now. If you are looking for a hard money lender, of course, there is there's a lot of websites out there for hard money lenders. In fact, Bigger Pockets, I believe, has the largest directory of hard money lenders and mm -hmm. it's free. To go and peruse, so biggerpockets.com slash hard money lenders. And again, if you're just getting started, that might be where you have to get started, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, just budget it. You know, I, mean, I mentioned I meant to mention this earlier. People might be surprised when they hear how much I paid for private or hard money at the beginning, or how much you're paying for private money, because they're used to hearing three percent, four percent, right? Yeah. And people are talking. But the one thing I remember, I still remember the day I read it. I read it in some early real estate book back when I was very getting, like, just getting started with real estate. And the person just mentioned, kind of offhand. Like, yes, certain types of financing is expensive. Hard money is expensive. You did, but just put it into your numbers when you run the math on your deal. And if it works out, then great. Who cares how much it is? I mean, technically, a, a lender right. can charge you 100 grand. But if you're still making the profit you want, Something. yeah, then yeah. it's worth it, right? So don't worry so much about how much they're making and, oh, that's unfair or that's a lot of money. Like, can you still make your money? Just plug it into your math when you do your numbers. And if, like, if you're using the bigger pockets calculators, like the flipping or the rental calculator or the bird calculator, you can actually put those fees and points right into the calculator themselves. Uh, yeah. Run the numbers, find out. So, yeah, yeah, no, then that's, and it, and how dare they make money? Yeah. You know? I mean, that's why I talk <laughs> about win win. I mean, it's like, yep. it's, it's their, it's their right to make money too. And, and they deserve to do that because they are taking a risk. And yep. so, um, and everything like that. And they deserve to get compensated for that risk as well. But like you said, as long as, uh, your deal makes money, as long as you hit your profit points that you want to make, uh, it's, uh, that's why I keep talking about win win because they should make money and so should you. Both sides should. And that's why I love private camp because you can discuss that until you hit a point that both sides see as a win. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. All right, cool. Um, next section or next question. I mean, uh, that's a good one. So, can I combine private money with an actual conventional loan? Like, can I get a conventional loan on the purchase and then private money on the re rehabs? Uh, how would that work? How could I structure something like that? Absolutely. Uh, it's very hard to do that as a loan. Like if I go and borrow money from ABC bank down the street and then go to David Green and have him loan me money as a set, like for the, for the, the, you know, the other part of it, like the down, the, the down money or whatever, it's gonna be very hard to do. Cause David is going to want, I'm going to want to give him some sort of collateral, a sec, a mortgage on the property. So um, it's going to be very hard to do, um, with that bank in first, because they're not going to want to see a second sitting behind them. Right. So you're going to need to do that through an equity arrangement and you can do it. It's done all the time. We do it through joint ventures. David, you know, shows up as a lender on, on the books of the deal, but he doesn't have collateral. So we give him a percentage of the profit too. So he has an interest, he gets an interest rate on his money, but then he gets uh, the percentage of profit. It's called a joint venture. And, um, we do that all the time. I talk about that in depth in the book. Super cool. Yeah. All right. Next question. I've heard many people say that you need a mentor as you're starting out. I've also heard people say that some people pay for these mentors or coaches. That's different than other areas of life where you don't have to pay for a, a mentor. What have people done? And if you do pay for your coach, how does the fee work? Mm. Um, 
I rarely, I'm, you know, I have paid for coaching. Uh, it didn't work out for me. I'd rather uh, either do like an apprenticeship type of thing where I, you know, find a way to add value to somebody's business and that they can, like, I can learn alongside them and every and, and that kind of thing. So I give them time in exchange for, uh, for the education, but real stuff, not just like, let me follow you around and, and ask you a million and a half questions and call that an apprenticeship. No, like, let me find a pain in your business and add value to it. And then, you know, like, like, let me like I help you raise your game as a, as an investor and call that an apprenticeship. But if, but, um, for mentorships, we've found, we found that like giving, uh, some sort of equity is, is the, is the best way to do it. Like, uh, I had a guy mentor me through my very first apartment, apartment building deal. And, um, you know, he got a small percentage ownership of that apartment building deal, um, and everything like that. So we were able to negotiate that way. Um, in that, so it would be a minority stake, but uh, we, we still got the lion's share, but in exchange for helping us, he was attached to the success of the deal. There you so, go. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the, the mentor thing is interesting. Cause like a lot of the terms are really kind of is. convoluted too. So like some people call themselves a mentor when they're really a coach and some people are a coach yep. and, and does that mean they're all bad? Are they all good? Like it's, it's such a broad thing. Uh, we always just advise people, be careful, you know, like be careful mm-hmm. with what you do. I mean, there are national mentors who you will never even step foot in the same room or talk with that you might pay 50 grand to, uh, or there might be the guy that lives <laughs> next door who owns three properties that will do it for free. Now, is one better than the other? Depends on what you're trying to do or how much money you've got to throw around. Or Everybody's different. Yeah, everyone's and, different. And you got to yeah. be able to speak to maybe the mentor that you're talking to just has an altruistic you know, vein in their blood or in, in, yep. in their arm or whatever. Like, like I just want to help yeah. uh, somebody. I want to feel like I'm giving back. Maybe that speaks to them. Um, maybe they're looking to expand their portfolio or maybe they've got a pain that you can help them address. But I think that in getting to know them and getting to know why they would help you yeah. um, is, is how you can address that. Yeah, you know, I was actually, when we were looking for questions for the fire round, another one uh, that we were, we were looking at, it was very similar. Basically said, I mean, what's with all these investors wanting money? If I was a veteran investor, I would kindly take on students and mentor them through deals. But like, <laughs> would you? Like, I don't, like... I, that's yeah. what, that's what you say before you've ever had to do deals or got busy. Yeah, exactly. You know? right. that's what people like, like, so <laughs> yeah, I understand. So say, so say it's the board yeah. person. You <laughs> exactly. Know, right? Like, right. Yeah. So like, the, I understand people wanting to charge money for mentoring, uh, but I also know that that is a lot of people. That is their business. They don't even do real estate. They just mentor people in real estate. and They don't even do real estate. That's a thing. We got to be careful of that. And the people that are just charging money for their time, uh, you know, and that's and, and you know, I don't want to make money for my time. I want to I want to create equity, uh, you know, and everything like that for myself and create more wealth and, and all. So uh, I've rarely taken compensation for my time for just talking to somebody getting paid by the hour. I, I'd rather, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it do a win-win where I get a small percentage of the yeah. asset or something like that in exchange for helping them win, um, or just helping somebody cause I care about them and, and doing like a, you know, a couple of phone calls or whatever, just cause it makes me feel good or it helps me give back or whatever, you know? Yeah. yeah that's, that's great. All right. Well, let's move on to the last segment of the show. Our famous four four questions of the day or the uh, last four for me. Anyway, uh, four questions we ask every guest every week. And uh, we want to see what you got to say. And I know you've answered these a couple times before, Matt, but maybe they've changed and maybe not. So number one, do you have a favorite real estate related book other than your own, of course? Oh, I can <laughs> say that. No, I can say now that. You can. Man. I know. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't say that before. Um, hmm. There, there, are, uh, there are quite a few real estate related books. Um, you know, I, I had the book lined up for the, for the second question, but I'll st- you know, I'll, I may have said this on the other podcast, but the book that really helped me. Uh, understand private money before I knew about it and whatnot was Rich Dad's Cash Flow Quadrant oh, yeah. because he talks about the ESBI uh, quadrants and I think that in the ca- the cash providers that invest in our businesses are in the I quadrant that's where we all want to be like you said the the guy just said he just walking out to your mailbox and getting that check yep. you're in the I quadrant uh, and and that's a phenomenal place to be because your money is what's making you money um, and that and I think we all strive for that but I think that in seeing my path starting out as an E. Uh, working through being self-employed and being S and now in the B quadrant and working my way towards just becoming just an I uh, where my money's making money for me uh, is, is phenomenal. And he talks a lot about how the real, how real estate provides that path. So rich dad's cash flow quadrant, I would have to say. All right. All right, Matt, what is your favorite business book? So my favorite business book is, is that, I, mean, I guess we call this a business book. It's really like a life book, but it's, it's life and air. And I heard yeah. you talk about it a lot on the podcast. Um, uh, Brandon, but I read it and it's phenomenal. It made me, it made me think about just, I'm going to make decisions based on time now. 
um, not based on like how much money can I make? No, this is how much time can I create with these decisions and stuff like and and that. So that that book's been phenomenal. Um, I've recommended it to others too. Um, so and that that's a recent book that I read. So thank you for plugging that. Yeah, no problem. I, yeah, that's one of my favorite books. Uh, I've been bugging David yep. Green here to read that for quite some time. I'm still working on him. He'll get there. Yeah, he'll get there. <laughs> All right, number three, David. What are your favorite hobbies? Um, I, I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old that keep me very, very busy. Um, so just, I, I just, I sound like a typical, you know, dad who's in love with his kids, but just hanging out with my kids. Um, I, I make wine. That's another hobby of mine. And, um, it's just, uh, travel. I've been doing more and more travel. I took my son for my four-year-old son. I took him for the first, his first roller coaster ride a couple weeks ago. And I sat him down and I was like, son, the only way to ride a, to ride a roller coaster is to sit up front, just so you know. And so he had, had a, we went in a little longer line to sit at the very, very front of the roller coaster. So just enjoying life and traveling and, and uh, creating memories with my family is probably my absolute number one hobby. And, you know, m- making pretty good wine is, uh, is the second one. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. All right, Matt, what do you think separates successful real estate investors from those who give up, fail, or never get started? Um, I... Today, I'll say the other two podcasts that have been on, I said something different, I believe, but this one I'll say, and this has to do with raising private money, but mitigating fear. Um, and let it, if you let fear stop you, it will. And, and, it, and fear can absolutely be an immobilizing emotion. Um, but if you can get through it and keep moving, even though you're afraid and getting to the point where I'm at, like you said, you know, like I'm, this new person's giving me money. That's a little scary. It still is. And everything like that. It just, I've never just the, the dirty little secret is the fear doesn't go away. And I think that people expect that, well, when the fear stops, then I'll start taking action. But the secret is that fear never goes away. You just learn to act in spite of it. And, and I think that, um, that's the key to success is just moving forward, even though you're a little scared, a little unsure and just being confident enough in yourself that I'll just keep putting one foot in front of the other and, you know, keep walking until, and, and, until I get to success. That's a great that's answer. Really yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Where can people find out more about you? So my uh, obviously bigger pockets, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm out there on, on BP, so you can check me out, I'm, I'm, you know, teaching webinars for BP and you can check out the book. Yep. Um, and, uh, you can also, uh, check me out on my company website, which is derosagroup.com. That's D E R O S A G R O U P.com. They can hear all about what we're up to. Perfect. All right, Matt. Well, like we said earlier, make sure you guys pick up a copy of the book. This is one of those books that, I mean, clearly if it pays for itself, if you can help, you know, get one more private lending deal somewhere in your future, uh, or get a little bit clearer understanding of SEC rules or on Mm -hmm. you know equity debt, all that stuff. It's one of those no brainer books. I think this is going to sell a billion and one copies because it helps every single investor out there. I just want to provide value. I just want to provide value Love to it. people and, and help them avoid making mistakes that I did when I first got started. So I, I talk about a lot of my personal story and a lot of mistakes that I made uh, in, in hopes that not to like out myself, but in hopes to help people avoid uh, doing that and they can have a clearer, cleaner path uh, to success for themselves. So uh, that, that's my hope. Super cool. All right. Well, Matt, thank you very much. We'll see you around Bigger Pockets. And also, I will say this you do an amazing job at teaching webinars uh, here on Bigger Pockets. So make sure you guys sign up for one of Matt's webinars. You do it every other week, right? Yes. So BiggerPockets.com. And, and, and oddly enough, Brandon, we yeah. talk about raising money. No way. <laughs> no way. <laughs> we talk about doing deals with other people with other people's money and how to make that happen and how to find it and how to, you know, how to assemble it and everything like that. So That's they awesome. should come join us for those too. They should. Biggerpockets.com slash webinar. Check it out there and uh, you'll see Matt's upcoming webinars there. And I believe David Green here is going to start doing some webinars, teaching some classes as well. Sweet. So, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're teaching the world how to do this stuff one investor at a time. So thank y'all. Uh, all right, Matt, get out of here. We'll see you later. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks, you. Matt. All right. Now was an interview with Matt Faircloth. Fantastic. Like, you know, I know a lot about raising private money because I've done it, but I still like my mind is exploding with information and excitement. Like, I'm I'm ready to go out and have some conversations about private money raising. Are you going to start raising some money yet, Greeny? I know we've been talking about it. If anything, Matt has me more intrigued with this than what I was before. Good. You know, like. You think you know something, then you hear someone who doesn't, you realize how much you don't know. And yeah, that's definitely, this is something that's going to happen in the future. I'm absolutely going to start raising money and making an effort to do that and kind of add some gasoline to my own Lamborghini over here. There you go. That was a nice analogy there. Well, good deal. Good deal. Well, uh, I don't know. What else you got? Anything for us? 
Yeah, I want to make one last point. Please. This is something I was thinking about while we were recording, but I didn't say it. This might be the absolute best time in all of our lifetimes to raise private money. Interest yeah. rates being stupid low and real estate being such a safe investment compared to other things has created an environment where people need to lend their money to get a return because they cannot get a return at the bank. They cannot get a return uh, – like with CDs, like all the typical ways that people look to earn a return, the interest rates are just stupid low. So you can raise money easier now than ever. If you've been thinking about doing this, I would highly recommend that you take the jump, buy the book, learn how to do it and start doing it just like I need to do myself because we all may look back 20 or 30 years and say, what the heck were we thinking not raising money when it was that easy? Yeah, that's so true. So true. So get out there, do it. Don't be afraid. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we'll see you next week on the Bigger Pockets podcast. We got some fun shows coming up here that we've uh, got planned out. So you guys are uh, in for some treats, especially David and I are going to be doing a solo show pretty soon, <clears throat> talking to you guys about some cool stuff on financial independence. And uh, got some news coming up on where Josh Dorkin has been and what the future of Josh Dorkin uh, is uh, looking like. Some kind of cool stuff going on there. So hang tight for that. And uh, we'll see you all next week for the Bigger Pockets right. podcast. My name is Brandon and this is David. You want to take us out? Yeah, this is David, don't need a last name, no last name. And Brandon <laughs> doesn't know the show number Turner. Signing off. Signing off. <laughs> Good job. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.